Thank you, everybody, for attending our Grand Rounds. Thank you for um, accommodating a, a change in our usual venue. Um, I would like to say thank you to our infectious diseases colleagues for hosting today's session um, and surely an interesting, I love a panel discussion personally, so I'm excited to see where this heads. Uh, and I'll introduce our Clinical Director of Microbiology, Dr. Karina Kennedy, to introduce her panel. Yep. Um, Thank you, everyone. I might just get straight into the session and because we'll introduce the panel members as we go um, through the presentation. Uh, it, it, it takes uh, goes over quite a number of months, so um, it's a bit of a story. Um, so the story starts uh, about three weeks into the presentation when a 64 um, year old woman presented down to a South Coast hospital with a three week history initially of abdominal pain and watery diarrhea followed mainly by dry cough and night sweats and that's what brought her into hospital she was febrile and and um you know desaturating mildly has a significant history of anxiety and depression for which she was being treated diabetes hypothyroidism and hypercholesterolemia um if you can see the um results there she had quite a um, significant inflammatory response with a raised crp and white cell count and some non-specific liver function abnormalities so her chest x-ray looked like this and it showed bilateral um, multifocal pulmonary infiltrates for which she was um, given a diagnosis of atypical pneumonia and commenced on benzoyl penicillin and doxycycline and discharged um, after three days in hospital. Unfortunately, about a week or so later, um, she still was feeling unwell and um, represented again with um, persistent cough and fever. And as you can see, she's still got a significant inflammatory response. But as you can notice on this occasion, it was highlighted that her eosinophils were quite elevated at 4.1. So she had uh, further imaging um, with CT scan, which again demonstrated um, sort of multifocal regions of pulmonary consolidation. And also on the abdominal scan, there was some hypoattenuating lesions in the liver and the spleen. And when you went, actually went back to her original presentation, she actually did have an eosinophil uh, rise early on uh, during the first admission. And this accounted for um, most of her, uh, of, of her neutrophils. So it was a 50% um, at one stage, which is quite impressive. And we, we tend to, at least from a parasite or, or infectious point of view, um, you know, uh, allocate mild, moderate and severe eosinophilia. And that gives us a little bit of a clue as to if it's infectious, what it might be. Um, so she was definitely in the severe range. So I'd just like to start by introducing um, Sanjaya uh, Senanaika, uh, infectious disease. Um, and just ask him to comment on what sort of things are you thinking about um, when you see a case of, you know, severe eosinophilia in someone that's presenting predominantly with pulmonary um, lesions and where would you sort of go with your um, investigations? Thanks, Karina. Uh, yeah. Ooh, can, is that working? No. You think he'd know how to use a microphone, wouldn't you? Okay, thanks. Uh, so when we see a, a febrile patient with potentially multi-organ disease and an eosinophilia, then we definitely think parasitic infections. In fact, if you just take it back to the basic eosinophilia, we immediately think of in our field parasites, but viruses can also be associated with uh, eosinophilia, particularly HIV, so that is something we think about, although you wouldn't necessarily expect a severe eosinophilia such as this. Uh, when the eosinophil counts particularly over 1.5, and we're thinking about parasitic infections, we're thinking about something that is widespread, but not necessarily in not necessarily something that we could detect on stool samples. So it's all always a challenge and therefore we have to dig into the history and see where they've been, what they've been up to in terms of exposures and remembering that infections, uh, worm infections like strongyloides can have a very long latent period, potentially decades. We have to really, really go back and not just look at the immediate 
past history with regard to travel and activities, uh, recreational activities. So, so this lady had actually um, immigrated from uh, England uh, for 20 to 30 years ago. And prior to that, she to coming to Australia, she'd actually been to South Africa and numerous countries in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, but apart from that, there wasn't any other travel or identifiable risk factors um, at the time. So certainly, if we're thinking decades ago, strongyloides is certainly there. Now, strongyloides, if it was uh, contracted years ago, it can reactivate if someone is immunosuppressed. So that's why, particularly if we see someone who's about to be immunosuppressed because of malignancy or um, autoimmune disease, we, we think about strongyloides serology if they've got a potential exposure history. Uh, schistosomiasis is, is another one that we, we think about. There are a whole lot of other diseases. Uh, do you want me to talk about what please and things? Yeah, so specifically with the lungs, because this seemed to be a, a pulmonary presentation that she's yeah. coming in with. So there's a syndrome called Loeffler's syndrome. As you know, these parasites move about in the body. They often come in through the, the skin, say with hookworms, or uh, are ingested, and then they move uh, maybe through the mesenteric or portal circulation. They often go into the lungs, uh, and then they'll be coughed up and swallowed into the, the gut or move to other parts of the body. So we think about a Loeffler's syndrome where you've got stages of the parasite larvae moving through the lungs, causing this transient respiratory illness with an eosinophilia. And there's a whole host that can do this, particularly Ascaris, but uh, Strongyloides, uh, Toxicara, they can all potentially do this. There's a syndrome called tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, which is not common, but is associated with uh, filariasis. So, so she was actually had some um, investigations, um, some serology. So I think if you can look behind or on on your chart, Sanjaya, um, I'm not really think I don't really think too informative. Not too informative, uh, particularly uh, now fasciola for those who, who don't know about uh, a liver fluke, uh, typically associated with water or aquatic vegetation, particularly watercress. And that tends to call a, cause a fairly distinctive hepatic pattern, but it can be associated with other parts of the body. But by itself, it's not a, an infection we commonly see in its most common form anyway. So to see it like this would be very unusual. Now, strongyloides is the one I'm always worried about, and it's not detected. But we also know that it's not the most sensitive test in the world, so it won't detect 100% of cases. And you marry that with the fact that we might do three stool samples over three days to look for over cysts and parasites, and even that's not 100% sensitive for parasites. In fact, there are a lot of these parasites that cause this uh, visceral larva migrants type presentation won't actually be shedding in the stool anyway. So we don't rule everything out on the basis of this, but probably schistosomiasis, uh, what was the other one, echinococcus and fasciola, I'd be pretty happy that they're less likely to be involved. But strongyloides, I wouldn't rule it out yet. So she actually went on for a bronchoscopy, and they're the, the micro results. Um, they did actually do um, look for helmets as well as do strongyloides um, DNA detection, and, and that was not detected. Um, uh, so are you happy? I'm going to end up treating her for strongyloides. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> hey, look, a positive result is helpful, and I'll balance that with the fact that ivermectin is uh, is relatively harmless. So it only doesn't work for COVID. <laughs> so she um, she also had um, some cytology performed. And I'd like to introduce Yash, who's one of our respiratory and sleep doctors and uh, show you the results of the cytology. Um, and maybe, yes, you can give us an opinion from a respiratory point of view when you see that sort of finding um, from, from lung specimens. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the cell differential from the alveolar large. I find that I often have to look at sort of the ATS guidelines about what is considered normal. 
up to about 3% of neutrophils is considered sort of within the range of normal. Lymphocytes 10 to 15% within a normal range. Um, macrophages are uh, far, uh, by far and away the most common cell you see, and more than 85% is considered normal. But uh, eosinophil eosinophils should be less than 1% of your total cell differential. So having a 30% differential is is um, sort of well outside uh, the realms of normal, and, and this is clearly an eosinophil predominant um, uh, cell differential. And it's also supported by the fact that um, we see some Charcot-laden crystals, which are those sort of rhomboid and sharp crystals, which I hope there are no pathologists in the room, but apparently the, oh, <laughs> well, tell me what, where I'm wrong here, but apparently it's sort of made up of the um, cell surface proteins of eosinophils that sort of conglomerate and form these crystals. So this is an eosinophil predominant cell differential. So what sort of etiologies are you thinking about with the sort of eosinophilic pneumonia? Mm. So there, there's a whole host of things for us to uh, consider here. Um, certainly there are um, idiopathic um, causes of uh, um, eosinophilia, pulmonary eosinophilia, which can be acute or chronic. But before we get to that, there are a lot of sort of commonly common associations that we need to uh, rule out. So um, importantly, a drug, drug induced lung injury. Um, now there's sort of a list of drugs that we may or may not remember, but I think if you're ever considering a drug induced um, lung injury, really what you should be doing is uh, plugging in all the patient's drugs, um, including anything they've taken in the last few weeks to months into um, a database called Pneumotox, which will tell us what um, uh, what, what the association is there. Um, uh, aside from drug-induced injuries, um, the other sort of broad things to consider, inhaled toxins. So we're thinking about things like smoking, vaping, uh, illicit drugs like cocaine, um, and, and sort of excessive dust exposure. There's sort of a bunch of cases of um, acute eosinophilic pneumonia around 9-11. Um, and then there are um, sort of airways diseases to consider. So asthma, certainly associated with uh, an eosinophil predominance in, in the differential. Uh, and ABPA, which is not sort of a um, an infection, but an allergic response to fungal antigens. Um, there are sort of rarer things to consider, like uh, radiation pneumonitis and um, certain cancers. Uh, and then, I mean, we obviously have to consider multi-system disorders, like important ones like EGPA, uh, but that depends on the patient's history. But from a sort of pure pulmonary perspective, uh, that's what I'd be thinking. And and what is the um, what what would be the difference between the acute eosinophilic pneumonia present or pneumonitis presentation versus a more chronic um, pneumonitis? Um, with uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, we usually expect sort of the the history of symptoms to last sort of four to six months or so. In acute eosinophilia, uh, typically less than one month. The Hello. Um, the uh, in, in sort of a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, you usually get sort of more peripheral um, uh, airspace sort of consolidation, um, uh, and it tends to be a sort of a lower lower low preponderance. Um, acute eosinophilic pneumonias can be a bit migratory. Um, uh, they, they can be sort of randomly spaced uh, with sort of bronchoalveolar thickening um, as well. Um, and like I said, sort of there can be idiopathic causes as well as sort of uh, causes sort of from, ex from acute exposures to sort of known known um, antigens. So so she was um, still being worked up down the, the coast and after the bronchoscopy, she was discharged with a sort of a provisional diagnosis of idi idiopathic chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and commenced on pregnisolone 30 milligrams daily with ongoing outpatient investigation and follow-up. Um, she was actually here on holidays in Canberra, um, at which stage she was actually feeling better. Uh, there was improvement in the wheeze and her cough, um, but she had sort of an acute deterioration where she had sudden onset of, of fevers and rigors, dyspnea and vomiting, and presented to the emergency department where she was actually a little bit hypotensive so um, she she ended up in ICU for a little bit. Sorry, um, 
wanted to um, maybe jump in and say we've talked about a lot of those things that could be happening in the lab, but um, you know, could any of them be associated with a peripheral ear condition? Um, Yash, have you ever seen the, the uh, you know, eosinophilic lung disease associated with a peripheral eosinophilia that yeah. high? Look, that's a, 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 not really. I mean, yeah, no, 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 that's very impressive. And yeah, I mean, I'd get nervous at that point and very much consult my ID um, and immunology and hematology I, colleagues. I think the, um, to be fair for the doctors down the coast, this was still a work in progress. And there was some other, you know, things surrounding that as well. And Katrina, we may need to get you to come to the stage soon, uh, <laughs> because I'm not sure I can bluff through immunology. <laughs> Is she okay? Uh, um, anyway, she was she was sort of started because she was hypertensive as a bacterial pneumonia, um, and and admitted to ICU with a little bit of um, inotropic support. Um, Yash, I was going to ask you again, it's probably a bit tricky to see from that perspective, but um, the x-ray on the left was her initial one first presentation and the one on the right is this current presentation. What do you think, um, what's I, your impression? I guess it's sort of a broad sweeping statement. There are some areas of improvement and some areas that look a bit worse. I'm um, sort of on the image to the left, I'm um, sort of clearly a multifocal, predominantly right-sided uh, patchy infiltrate um, which affects sort of all zones of the lung and perhaps some reticular changes in the left upper zone. Uh, on the right, um, a lot of the right lower zone changes look a little bit better, but clearly in the right upper zone, there's a bit more of a hazy opacity, a new wedge-shaped opacity um, adjacent to the left heart border, which wasn't there before. But probably the most striking thing I think is um, the right hemidiaphragm's a lot more elevated than it was before, and there's possibly a small effusion, which uh, make us think of a few things and certainly, I mean, with the eosinophilia, I wonder if she's developed a mononeuritis multiplex with that right hemidiaphragm um, elevation. Yeah, she actually had very little symptoms outside of the respiratory tract um, already. Um, Carolyn is online, but she can't unmute herself. So, I, <laughs> Katrina, take the stage. Uh, <laughs> um, this shows her admission. So she was actually in, in Canberra Hospital for two weeks um, being further investigated. And when she she arrived, she actually had a moderate ES, peripheral blood eosinophilia um, and she was put back onto 50 milligrams of pregnisolone. And you can see it dropped quite nicely. Um, she was then put back to, uh, I think, 37.5 milligrams and it shot up again. Um, so, so she was commenced back on 50 milligrams. Um, sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> I was going to introduce Carolyn Hawkins, but I'll introduce <laughs> Katrina instead. Um, immunology, and and just sort of um, I've got some slides that Carolyn's made, but I was just sort of think, I wanted to ask um, from an in, immunology point of view, how would you investigate this? What what sort of things are you thinking about, and and where would you go from here? So I mean, the biggest problem we have with the eosinophilia is that it is very steroid responsive, um, and in fact. Um, one of the signs of Addison's disease that you're, you've, you've got just slightly less steroid that you should have on board is actually you develop a peripheral eosinophilia. So it's incredibly steroid responsive. Um, and so we're always caught between how much information we can get from the diagnosis before we fix the problem, <laughs> but also knowing that eosinophils are incredibly cardiac toxic. And the longer that we have them with an eosinophil count like this, it's silent, but their heart is suffering. Um, and then suddenly they'll have a tachycardia or something will go wrong. Um, and so uh, we try to get as much information, you know, before we fix the problem by just giving, we can give enough steroids, we can always make the eosinophils go away, but we need to try to work out what the what the underlying um, cause is. So from our point of view, the top ones that we worried about are um, a variant of an anchovasculitis, so eGPA. Um, we worry about hyperosinophilic syndromes. Uh, we usually end up managing the um, <laughs> lymph, yeah, the lymphocytic variants. Um, so even if, and I hope Sam won't hit me, even though they're caused by, caused by a clonal T-cell population. <laughs> Um, the T cell, the, you don't need very many abnormal T cells to make a lot of IL-5, and so that makes the eosinophil response 
very big, even though the clonal T cell population is very small. And so they don't usually need any sort of nasty wipe out all their blood cell kind of chemo. But <laughs> um, and so they're they're the ones that um, we worry about. Um, we worry about drug reaction um, with the eosinophilia and systemic features, but I've never seen anyone uh, like this. Um, I've never seen anyone with rheumatoid arthritis with eosinophils like this either, you know, the peripheral we, count. We put that in because Carolyn mentioned yeah. we've seen two cases. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. recently, yeah. not that high, but it was, yeah. it was yeah. four, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, four. yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, IgG4 disease for some reason is sometimes associated with high levels of IgE and, and eosinophilia as well. Um, and then, you know, we just have to think about all of the other causes. We're always worried because our diagnoses are diagnoses of exclusion. So we want to make sure that all of the other things are, are, have been ruled out before we step in and really blast the eosinophils away. And I, I think this slide was to demonstrate, I'll talk on Carol's behalf, <laughs> that, that, you know, it, it requires quite an extensive investigation, as you said, Katrina, because it's it's a diag diagnosis of exclusion and you might be able to solve the problem, but, but you haven't don't found out the other solved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, So that was, and it's often a multidisciplinary approach as well. Um, with input from various um, different teams. So Katrina, you've probably never seen this, but this was the immunology that she test she had. Does so, that help at all? Uh, so the um, anchor tests are negative um, and um, you can theoretically have eosinophilic granulomatosis polyangiitis without an anchor by the classif classification, but then there's always the concern whether that actually is a true vasculitis or a variant of a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. But you could, if you have a vasculitis by biopsy, but the anchor's negative, that would still... So you'd like bad. a biopsy? Uh, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Uh, a biopsy is always helpful in, in these situations. If we were going to treat for anchor vasculitis, I would want to have a biopsy that showed vasculitis before I started treatment. Um, the, there's a cytoplasmic pattern on the ANA, but it doesn't say what it was. Um, so again, that might have been that there's some other sort of non-specific anti-mitochondrial antibodies or something else going on for her, but there was certainly no nuclear pattern. Um, and the IgE um, is actually very low for someone who lives in Canberra or on the south coast. <laughs> I know our reference range says 100, but um, I think anyone in Canberra is allowed to get to 1,000 before I think there's anything wrong with them. Um, and the complement levels are high rather than low. So, yeah, and the tryptase level um, being normal uh, is helpful in probably saying that there's probably, well, doesn't. If the tryptase level was high, we'd be concerned about a myeloid malignancy, but the tryptase being normal doesn't rule that out. So she did actually have a lung biopsy and and the um it it, it the conclusion was eosinophilic pneumonia, um, but there was an absence of cell wall damage, which was against Scherf Strauss disease, which is the previous name. So are you happy then it's probably not a systemic vasculitis. I would be uncomfortable treating for vasculitis in this context, but uh, there's obviously still something, <laughs> something going, going on. on. Yeah. yeah. All right. So then I'd like to introduce Sam Bennett and oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, Sam Bennett um, from Hematology. Um, so Sam, <laughs> Sam, what, how would you go now? Like in, in, as Katrina mentioned, there could be, it could be driven by a hematological um, clonal cell. Um, you know, what, what is your approach? Um, so thanks Karina. We approach, well, we have, uh, we come across this issue in sort of two different um, angles. One in my, when I'm wearing my pathology hat, when I'm in the lab, we quite commonly see films with high eosinophils and you'll see a very long worded comments with differential diagnosis on it. But in this case, I was actually seeing this lady um, as a clinical consult. And the two things that we're really concerned about, particularly with extreme eosinophilia, um, where there's evidence of organ toxicity, so in this case, sort of lung damage, is is there actually an underlying neoplasm that's driving it? And, and that can either be uh, 
clonally related or unrelated to the eosinophilia. So probably more commonly what we see is actually clonally unrelated eosinophilia. So that's in the context of something like a lymphoma, particularly Hodgkin lymphoma or T-cell lymphomas. But in this case, this patient didn't have any lymphadenopathy. It would be very rare to have Hodgkin lymphoma without any lymphadenopathy. Um, and similarly, I mean, I guess she'd had steroids, which potentially could have you know, shrunk them away if that had happened before imaging had occurred. But I wouldn't really think after, and it had been now sort of several weeks of steroids that you would have thought she'd have a more overt evidence of a <clears throat> an non-clonally related neoplasm. But the bigger concern we had was, did she have one of these rare, um, uh, um, now quite well recognized um, uh, myeloid slash lymphoid neoplasms with eosinophilia and rearrangements of FGFR, PDGFR alpha or PDGFR beta. It's a whole chapter now in the WHO um, uh, a classification of uh, myeloid and lymphoid diseases. And um, the probably the most common one of these is what's known as, um, well, it commonly presents as just a chronic eosinophilic leukemia with high eosinophils, commonly with pulmonary or cardiac damage. And that was the one we were really concerned about in this case. Although the thing that goes against that is this patient is female. And weirdly enough, that particular fusion protein FIP1L1 PDGFR alpha seems to occur at a ratio of 70, 17 to 1 men to women. So, I mean, obviously you couldn't have ruled it out, but that was one of the things we were thinking about. That's actually a pretty easy test to do. You can do it on a bone marrow and <clears throat> you can look for um, this deleted region of chromosome 4Q called CHIC2, which results in those two genes coming together, FIP1L1 and PDGFR alpha and leads to the production of a abnormal fusion protein product, which drives this expansion of clonal eosinophils. It can actually present with other associated um, neoplasms as well. So sometimes you can have concurrent acute myeloid leukemia. In this case, the patient didn't have pancytopenia or leukerythroblastosis or any, any concern in that regard. We've actually just had a recent case in a young man here where they had a, a concurrent diagnosis. Um, and there's now actually a whole series of other rearrangements that are being recognized that we can pick up um, using um, fluorescence in situ hybridization on marrow cells, uh, particularly um, uh, PDGF beta and FGF uh, um, gene rearrangements leading to these chronic eosinophilias. And why it's really important, although these are very rare, I think the estimated instance is somewhere around three in a million or even less than that, um, is that particularly the PDGFR alpha and beta are extremely sensitive to imatinib, which we use for treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia, but in fact, it really low doses. So about a quarter of the dose we'd normally use. And in fact, some studies suggest you can give as little as one dose a week, and that's enough to get the eosinophilia under control and prevent damage to, to organs. So she did have a bone marrow and she also had some other hematological investigations. What do you make of those? Um, well, you can see that the fusion uh, transcript wasn't uh, detected and the two fish probes we use in our lab were both negative. <clears throat> um, there are now a couple of other rearrangements that we don't have the ability to test for. So there's something called a PCMI JAK2 fusion, which I believe Victorian Cancer um, Genetics does do. So we would potentially now, although at the time we didn't have the capacity to do this, would have sent that away. Um, and certainly on flow cytometry, there was no evidence of lymphoma, although to be honest with you, flow cytometry is pretty difficult for uh, T cell lymphomas, and it's certainly useless for Hodgkin lymphoma, so that wouldn't really help. But as I said, that wasn't really high on the pretest probability anyway. Oh, yes, and the weak clonal band, of course. <laughs> um, I guess uh, it's a uh, it's a difficult thing for people to get their head around, but clonality doesn't mean it's a neoplasm, so you certainly can have expansion of clones. Um, quite why this falls into the, well, I guess the lymphocytic variant of hyper eosinophilic syndrome would typically be associated with a TCR gene rearrangement and expansion of an abnormal clone. Um, so that I guess there's some circumstantial evidence here, although it's not um, overwhelming. Um, and so I think that's what led us down the, th the thinking that perhaps that was the driver of what was going on here. But I wouldn't say it's diagnostic by, you know, you know by any means. So, so I think, would it be fair to say at that stage, there was a possibility that she had a, um, lymphocytic hyperacetylic syndrome, but you're still. Yeah, like, I think, I think we, we, we remain skeptical, yeah. but acknowledge that this lady was ill and she needed 
more treatment than the steroids was providing. Yeah. And we had no better explanation, noting that she'd been extensively investigated by other teams. Yeah. Um, and it didn't fall into my remit because for whatever cultural reason, as uh, Katrina points out, the lymphocytic variant is managed by immunologists. So. So um, she was actually discharged from Canberra Hospital on weaning dose of pregnisolone, but um, as a steroid sparing agent also commenced on uh, mycophenolate. And in subsequent outpatient review, she was actually struggling um, in terms of um, steroid related complications. So she, whenever she weaned the steroid, she tended to get flares in her symptoms, but she was putting on weight. Um, she had a significant um, pre existing anxiety, depression that was potentially getting worse, and her diabetic control um, was come, becoming. Uh, problematic. There, on imaging, there did seem to be some improvement in the pulmonary um, and liver lesions. So later on in the uh, year, she was actually commenced on mepiluzumab um, through compassionate access, which is a um, interleukin five inhibitor. Um, and as you can see, it, it aims to switch off um, the eosinophils. And this seemed to actually work quite well in terms of her. Uh, eosinoph peripheral eosinophil count, and as you can see, um, after she commenced, it was back down to the normal range. The the um, you know it's it's a different um, chart there. All right, um, but probably her GP and and she had a um, psychiatrist were quite astute in that they picked up that there was, there was just some worsening um, neurological um, symptoms. So she had this. Um, Treatment resistant depression that was worse than normal. She had worsening memory and cognitive function. And, and this was now on 7.5 milligrams of pregnisolone. So she had managed to wean it um, quite significantly. So they did pursue um, a organic cause and um, performed a, a CT scan. And I'd like to introduce Hari Bandy, who's one of our neurosurgeons. And I'd just like, um, Hari, if you can discuss the, the findings on the imaging. Thank you, Karina. Um, I appreciate everyone's information so far. I've learned a lot already for a case that I was involved in. Um, and mine is going to be more of a personal recount and somewhat of a therapy session for myself because this is a very traumatic experience for me. So um, <laughs> I'll start with how the case was presented to me. This is a summary that was communicated in our WhatsApp within our neurosurgical registrar. So Coast Weird One is how it opened. Post GP. Um, 64 year old frail eosinophilia unknown origin since January 21 high dose steroids since type 2 diabetes OSA refractory depression auditory hallucinations so psychiatrist ordered a CT non con I think this was prior to thinking about commencing ECT um, and the non con CT is what you're seeing here and it was described or reported as being calcifications. Now you could say, I don't know if anyone can actually see the abnormality, um, but so right frontally, there's some area of hypodensity right there. Yeah, there you go. Um, and there's a little also a bit of hyperdensity within it. So it's a bit mixed. If this person was involved in trauma, you might think that that was a traumatic injury, um, but she had no trauma history. And our initial interpretation of that was this is some sort of chronic lesion that's got calcification involved, and that's what it was reported as. So then she was advised to have a non-urgent repeat M like MRI to follow up, which is what then the next lot of imaging shows you. So this is the imaging from Southeast Radiology at two weeks later. Um, and what it shows is an area of contrast enhancement with more edema, but now actually the edema is much more extensive, which seems surprising within a two week period for what we were originally thinking, which was either something that should be resolving, which maybe might be some sort of trauma that she's not reporting to us or a uh, tumoral lesion that had calc calcification changes. So you wouldn't expect this much contrast enhancement. You wouldn't expect this much flare changes, which suggests edema within the brain. So that's why we went on to, um, I guess, canvas widely. So when we don't know what something is, We've got to go and present it to our neuroradiologists. Um, thankfully, our neuroradiologists have some experience in the subcontinent where there is much more endemic sort of um, exposure to these conditions like neurocystosicosis, uh, schistosomosis, which I can't even pronounce still, um, hydatid cysts. And that's like the extent to which I know about parasites from my neurosurgical training. So neurocystosicosis was kind of what we were thinking, um, and, but there was nothing that looked like it at all. Uh, and we discussed briefly tapeworm at the time, and the advice from the neuroradiology meeting was to do an LP. Now, this is a lady who my interaction with was already uh, 
difficult and strained um, in the sense that she was on the coast, she'd already been at Canberra Hospital for extensive periods of time. She did not want to come here and have another investigation just to show nothing useful. Um, so it took a lot of convincing. And I think she also suffers from some agoraphobia and paranoid um, feelings. And she described herself very interestingly and I think very aptly. Um, she's like, I you know I'm, a, I'm very English. I'm feeling very uncontrolled. I can't seem to control my emotions. And when I was explaining to her, well, you've got something in your frontal lobe, she was desperate for this to be the reason rather than losing her very Englishness. So that was probably the clincher that brought her in. I did not see her physically before um, in clinic before getting her booked in for the um, stealth guided MRI. So we normally perform uh, imaging that's stealth guided, which is that's the um, brand name for it, but it's basically stereotactic imaging, which uses three point um, identification triangulation to identify one millimeter of accuracy within the MRI. So when you have an MRI or some sort of imaging modality prior, you then fix the patient's uh, head to a frame. You can localize one millimeter within the in, within the brain um, at at depth as well. So, but because her lesion comes to the surface um, and it involves the dura, it has some dual enhancement. We I thought let's biopsy, open biopsy rather than a needle. Um, open biopsy because we can get dura at the same time and visualize the tissue because I don't uh, anyone who's ever done a frozen section or come into our, our theaters to see a needle biopsy we lose a lot of the tissue we don't really get a lot of feel for the tissue at all we go oh it's gray versus it's white so don't really get a sense of that at all so given its location the decision was for an open biopsy now if this was deeper that would not have been the case so there's a lot of I think just amazing luck in identifying what what actually occurred. So um, we then did this planning. That's not her planning MRI, but I just wanted to put up some imaging for you to show you what that looks like, where we um, fix her head to the pins and then localize the lesion. And we did an open biopsy, which is just through a mini craniotomy. Um, on opening the dura, we noticed the area that was contrast enhancing prior um, had some was injurated and looked a bit inflamed. So we sent that away. And then on opening the brain itself on, onto the um, cerebral surface, we noticed that it was, again, a little bit injected, red, swollen, but nothing, again, really apparent. My registrar took some samples at the time um, and we were sending them off. And yes, they looked a little bit abnormally gray compared to what we normally see. Again, nothing that unusual. But in typical um, micromanagement fashion, I decided that I would go and look at it again and have a feel to see if there was anything that was like a border for the lesion because I didn't want this lady to come away from something as involved as a brain biopsy and not have an answer yet again. We were told CNS eosinophilia is extremely rare. So at the end of the day, the right frontal lobe, a small biopsy of the right frontal lobe would seem like a low risk procedure. And I thought that would be a reasonable thing to offer. When I consented her, that's what I discussed. We'd take off the lesions that we saw abnormally. So then what I did, which is I find it hard to talk about, but that's what I did. Um, is that my registrar had already taken away biopsies um, and was sending away for frozen. At the time, I isolated a part of the lesion that clearly through my instrument, which we call a Penfield 1, felt abnormal. It felt like a tumour that had a bit of grain to it um, and I was able to isolate it out. Um, and then it felt like there was something that was completely separated from the rest of the brain and I took my tumour holding forceps and lifted it up. And then my first thought was, Oh, the psychiatrist have put something into her brain. <laughs> Open disclosure, that was my first thought. My registrar said, is that the MCA? <laughs> and, um, it's the truth. And, um, and I'm like, no, it's moving. Take it out of my hand right now. Take it out of my hand. I'm going to kill it. Take it out of my hand. Because the temptation to fling it away from me was really high. Um, but we put it down and we all just took a moment to breathe and it was trying to escape from the pot. Um, and then, of course, we've now got a very unexpected result with an open brain, and I'm not sure what other lesion I need to remove or whether there's ova or sister or I don't know any of these things. So we were desperately calling and very excited at the time um, after yeah, being a little bit a little bit ill. And we called, yeah, we called everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Going and, and in retrospect on the MRI, yeah. So what's interesting is that at the radiology meeting, 
neurosurgery, we love T1 with contrast and T1 images. They are uh -huh. lesional images. This is a T2 image, oh, right? T2. So this is T2 and flare. Uh -huh. And what's interesting about that is this in this in retrospect, the radiologist said, oh, you can so obviously see the worm. And I'm like, of course you can. So, you know, so you can kind of see a squiggly line. And to be fair, if I had really paid attention to the T2, we use T2 mostly for anatomical things rather than lesional things. So if I'd looked at that T2, the other thing I'll say as well, full disclosure, is that that is a very different location to the southeast imaging. So this is all rapidly moving. Um, and I don't know if I really appreciated it at the time. It was uh, same gyri, but different location definitely within that gyri. So um, again, there was probably three weeks between the two MRIs or maybe four weeks because it took a while to convince her. Um, but in retrospect, perhaps you could say that you could see it. So I'll just introduce myself now. Um, so I was involved, I was sitting in clinic and I get this text message from Catherine Davison who was on call and had got a text message from neurosurgery and saying, what do you think that is? And, and that made my afternoon. And as soon as I finished, I sort of ran up and had to retrieve it from AP to make sure they didn't put formalin on it. Um, and it was still moving. Um, uh, and this is what it looked like under our, our plate microscope. Um, and uh, we, we're pretty simple in microbiology, none of this um, sort of hematology type stuff. Um, but, but helmets, like worms, are, are basically split up into different types based on their shape. So you've got trematodes, nematodes, and cestodes. And this was clearly a round worm, um, so it was a nematode. Um, so I then put my registrar to work and said, you know, what, what nematodes invade the brain? And uh, we found a journal article, but really when we looked at all of these, it couldn't have been them because they're all too small. They don't grow to that size in humans. And, and so as I was leaving, I texted Catherine back and I said, well, this is my diagnosis. I think it's an animal Ascaris that's got lost. Um, and, and then I went home and I thought, well, who do you ask if you get something weird in infectious diseases and, and microbiology that, um, that you haven't seen in humans. So, of course, you ask a vet and, and, and this was a colleague I've been working for on, she's a veterinary virologist. So she'd been doing all the SARS phylogenetic genetic analysis for the ACT during the pandemic. And, uh, and so I asked her, you know, I showed her the. The picture and of course her first response was finally a, a use for ivermectin um and and then she came up with a list she went to a notes a university notes and came up with a list and and then kind of made a remark oh how cool would it be if it's the first case of the marsupial one and i said what's the marsupial one and and she found um it, that it's actually a python one ophidoscaris and um, but it causes visceral larva migraines in in marsupials, and uh, she directed me to that uh, journal article, and this is a um, post mortem of a koala, and you can see the there's a, a a larva there coming out of the portal vein, and another one from paravertebral um, tissue, which did look very similar to ours um, in size and shape. But I spent the night. I just couldn't find any reports in humans. So I thought this is incredibly doesn't happen. Um, so there must be something else. And I was sort of going around and the only thing I could find was diaphylaris, which causes uh, a heartworm in dogs. And there are reported cases in, in humans of infection. So uh, the next morning, um, Sanjaya, who was on for consults was eagerly awaiting what the diagnosis was because he had to go and talk to this lady. And um, he'd also found, um, you know, diaphylaris is associated with um, um, human infection and, and found a reference of finding it in the brain as well. Um, but we still didn't really know how we were going to identify it. Um, and then, and then uh, Robin helped again and said, well, I know this person from the CSIRO, they're a ex-CSIRO, um, they're a parasitologist and they're actually an expert in nematodes. So I, I uh, tried ringing Dave, um, but he didn't answer. So I sent him an email and I was trying to ring a few other people around the country, uh, but luckily he got back to me and um, we actually organized transportation of the, uh, the, uh, the worm uh, to his lab over at, um, on the north side. And, and he still tells me it was moving when he received it as well. Um, 
and and it was it was like um 2 30 that afternoon he got back to me very excited and said it's it's ophidoscaris robertsii and um commented that these nematodes are great wanderers in host tissues um so if you look at the um oh and then then we you know he he um made that um diagnosis based on the morphological features so Parasitologists, they, they often look at the mouthpieces and tails to actually identify um, parasites morphologically. But nowadays we also um, have a lot more molecular techniques. So it got a little bit dissected. Some got sent to Sydney and some got sent to Melbourne, again, to veterinary parasitologists who independently also confirmed it uh, mole by molecular techniques as being Ophidoscaris robertsii. So, um, just a little bit about the life cycle, it, the definitive host, that's where the adult worm lives. So what we were seeing was not an adult worm, it was a larva. Um, the adult worm lives in the gastrointestinal tract of the uh, carpet or diamond python. Um, so it's, it's specific, I think, to Australia plus maybe uh, Papua New Guinea. And um, the eggs are, are excreted in the python feces and they can contaminate the environment and uh, are consumed um, by little marsupials. Um, who then, uh, within their gastrointestinal tract, the eggs will hatch into microscopic larvae, and they then disseminate through the body. And over time, they they go into different stages and can become quite large, as we saw in our patient. Uh, unfortunately, um, the life cycle continues when the snake consumes the uh, antichinus, and um, those larvae can then develop into adults. So they only develop into adults once they get into the snake. So Sanjaya. Mm -hmm. um, what what did you find with our patient? How did she manage to get a python parasite in her brain? Yeah, so look, I, I don't think we'd have ever, if we never got that worm, that larval stage, we'd never have gotten the diagnosis. It would have taken, a, taken much, much longer. So immense gratitude for the horrible experience you went through. <laughs> Uh, so once we worked this all out and we had experts from everywhere telling us uh, what this is and how it spreads, we went back to the patient. She lives in a part of the south coast which is very close to a lake, so it's, uh, it, so it's not a suburban area as such. And there are, lot, there are pythons and snakes about. In fact, she's sort of seen them on her roof before, but as we were talking about with the life cycle, it's not direct contact with s snakes, it's contact with things that snake feces have come, up, come into contact with. So we can't be sure, but she does do one thing, which is around the lake, there's a plant called warrigal greens, which I hadn't heard of before, some of my colleagues had, and she would collect them regularly and use them for making salads or stir fry. Now, again, it's speculation, but we suspect that the pythons would have contaminated the warrigal greens and either during the preparation or the consumption of that, she's become secondarily infected. And of course, Karina and I were just talking about today's presentation, what, a couple of days ago, and Karina raised a very good point of, while this was all happening and while she was back at home for the last couple of years, could she have been reinfecting herself? And of course, yes, that, that's, that's quite plausible too. So while we can't prove it, we suspect that uh, consumption, probably through the Warrigal Greens, is the uh, likely route for her. And could you just give a bit of an update on how she's going now? Sure, sure. Look, I, I think whenever you just discover a new infection, while it's sort of exciting for us, it's horrible for the patient because uh, one, it's, it's terrifying and B, the treating doctors don't know how to treat it because there's never been a case before. So she's been tremendously courageous. Uh, she did improve after we get, after the larva was removed and she stopped all her immunosuppression. She definitely got better but she's continuing to have a lot of uh, issues with her chronic mental health problems. She, in fact, is going up to see a neuropsychology unit in Sydney about which specialised in frontal lobe issues. So to this day, we're not, there probably was an exacerbation of her symptoms, her psychiatric uh, 
or mental state issues due to the presence of that larva in her frontal lobe. But I, I don't know if that's what's contributing to her current mental state. It may just be just a, a worsening of what was there in the past. But having said that, she's, uh, you know, been a very courageous and uh, wonderful patient. We're keeping her in, um, keeping in touch with her remotely in terms of blood tests and imaging and checking in on her. And did she receive any parasitic treatment? Yes, uh, at the time we, well, actually before she, uh, before we got this diagnosis, she, and we started her on immunosuppression, she received uh, some antiparasitic treatment. She got I ivermectin. As I said, that will treat a, uh, that'll treat stronger loides, which I, uh, I was worried about, although I wasn't involved in that initial treatment, but it will also treat a lot of other parasitic infections and it's relatively harmless. Subsequently, we gave her more, once we had this, we gave her more ivermectin and albendazole in concert with some prednisone. Now, the rationale for the ivermectin, uh, there's some cases in snakes where they've used ivermectin or something similar to that. It's uh, so we use that in her. The issue with ivermectin, it doesn't have good CNS penetration. So we used albendazole, which is another agent uh, that does have good CNS penetration. And of course, if you're ever going to kill things in the brain, which might lead to a big inflammatory response, particularly with parasites, and we see this with neurocystosarcosis, we tend to add prednisone or some sort of steroid to dampen that inflammatory response so it's not deleterious to the host. So she got that combination treatment. She's been off the prednisone for a very long time and uh, you heard about her progress. All right. Um, I'm sorry, we have managed to go over a bit today, but is there any questions from the audience or any closing remarks from the panel members? Oh, Peter. On the repeat MRIs, her, her, her brain lesions improving with less edema. I feel like we did one progress MRI and the edema was coming down, and we didn't really do six sequential MRIs. But no, she, so she's had one MRI, which uh, uh, Hari and her teams had a look at, and we've had a look at. So it's less edema, but the recommendation is to repeat it in, in a couple of months, which we're doing. And Paul. So this is clearly a multi-system disease. Has she had multiple larvae in her lungs and her liver and her brain? Or is this just one larva that migrates from uh, through those various tissues? It, it's a good question. Well, it's possible that it, it's you know, one larva, but uh, it, it may be that there are more. And that's why we gave the ivermectin, just to kill whatever else is outside the CNS. Um, so really, without actually digging in there, we we won't be able to tell. But she, she did have bilateral lung lesions, so I think what's happened is the eggs have hatched in her gastrointestinal tract. They're then gone through the liver, gone through the lungs, and potentially they could be in any other tissue in her body as well. And for some reason, this one managed to lodge in the brain and could grow to such a large size because it was about ten centimeters long. I, I think at the time of the exacerbation, which she came in through ICU. We actually had a PET scan, I think, and that was mentioned there was sort of lesions or there was changes in the liver. So I think it definitely was not just. Yeah, and I, I think the liver lesions have completely resolved now and the pulmonary lesions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, Karina or Sanjaya, what's happened to her eosinophil count? She's not on any steroids anymore. Um, have the eosinophils completely normalized? Uh, they had Chong, but just because of the, and she's due for another blood count, but due to the mental health issues I talked about, it's just <laughs> taking a while to get a, a follow up full blood count. But yeah, that's a very important question. I think by the time she'd come in, like to neurosurgery, she'd had normal eosinophils for six months, but saying that that was on mepaluzumab. Um, but then afterwards, at least she was. Her eosinophils were normal too, weren't they? For a while, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, terrifying case. Um, obviously, we probably had a respiratory initially a lot of the time. Uh, the two questions. Um, I mean, anything that we could have done differently. It took this lady almost eighteen months to get to a diagnosis. Um, yeah. Would there be anything that we do differently this time around? And the second question. I mean, 
in our attempts to treat her and follow the different differentials, we actually sort of prevented her body from trying to address the issue. We stopped, we obliterated her eosinophil count. Do we think this was the pathology all along or because of our treatments, we predisposed her to sort of this, this particular helminth? Yeah, I mean, I, there's, it, there's no way of diagnosing. That's the problem with these visceral lava migrants because that you don't find anything in the feces, the, the worm's not in the human intestinal tract. So the only way you can do it is if there happens to be a antibody test, like for common things like strongyloides or, um, or toxicara, or you actually manage to biopsy something that contains the worm. Um, so I don't think this was possible at all to diagnose beforehand, but it was an interesting point whether her immunosuppression then allowed this, um, this worm to grow because it was, um, you know, not being attacked so much by her eosinophils. But then again, that also led to the diagnosis. So, from yeah. the respiratory point of view, our patient a couple of years ago was imported Nepal or Americanus to cure his asthma. So you buy the worms in. I don't know how many of us quarantine. You stick it back onto your hand until they invade. He turned up at Calvary and presented with an eosinophil lung cancer. And was very distressed that we were going to kill these worms and send them alive. So it's hookworm. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think the, the point um, was well made, Marina, just then, but the patient also had sort of general anti parasitic therapy. And often we do that before we will go down this path of saying, look, we really have no other better explanation. We know that the things that we're going to do are potentially helpful. So we really want to make sure we rule it all out. Mm. So, um, and, no. I mean, the bone marrow biopsy, just a point about the bone marrow, it did actually get a bit delayed. And one of the, I wasn't involved in the very, very original consult, but there was some concern raised that because she'd had steroids, there was no point doing your bone marrow biopsy, but that's not actually correct. So, you will still be able to detect those rearrangements in a bone marrow, even if they had steroids, because as I said, the changes are actually in. Uh, pluripotential myeloid lymphoid cell, so you should still be able to find them. So it's still worth doing it, and certainly still worth doing it through peripheral blood, because you don't even have to have a marrow. You can literally get a three point zero one PDG marrow on a peripheral blood sample. But also to add to that thing about you know the incident of the cure because you're on methadone, I think it's important to remember that you've not actually fixed the underlying problem. Yeah. You're, if you're going to prevent the damage from the incident, but whatever's driving the incident is, you know, it's the same as same. Same as if you put them on an IL six blocker, it's great, but they see is normal. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, uh, well, no, well, short answer is if we think that she got it through consuming uh, vegetation, if yes, household context would be relevant, but she's isolated, lives alone, so. No, but yes, that, that is a very good point. The other thing I was just going to add as well. Yeah, we do think that being on all that anti eosinophilic treatment possibly led to it migrating into the CNS because even in marsupials or small mammals, it's never been reported in the CNS before. I should just clarify and say that this is the first human case in the world of this. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, at the back up in the stairs. Confirm like the hypothesis that it came from the body of things. Is there any sort of studies that you can do over or something on the on that plant to confirm that it was from the plant? Oh look, absolutely. Environmental studies is the next step, but we just you know, we're not in a position to do that at the moment. But that is the next step to, to find fun. out. <laughs> 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 All right, well, uh, one last, one last one. <laughs> yeah, there is no doubt it's a difficult case, but I want just to highlight a take home message from here. Uh, liver lesion usually is not a manifestation of xenophilia. So when you have xenophilia and liver lesion, you have to dig and dig, dig on parasites. Uh, number two, usually the symptomatic xenophilia is not, un is not common at all in the absence of immunosuppression. 
uh, uh, number three, uh, this patient probably did not have any neurological manifestation because the lesion was in the front lobe and the front lobe is more or less a silent lobe. Yeah. 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 All righty. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thanks for the panel members. Uh, it was very late notice, but thank you. <laughs>